Federal Domestic Violence Awareness webinar entitled Help Your Neighbor. I'm so excited to be your host this morning. My name is Audrey Bierman. I'm one of the Deputy Bureau Chiefs here at the Domestic Violence Bureau at the Queens County District Attorney's Office. This morning webinar was born out of something that's come to our attention in our own lives here at the DA's office, which is that even those of us in the criminal justice system don't always know what to say or do when a friend or colleague is going through intimate partner violence. So our hope for today is that every participant walks away with at least one thing that they didn't know, one resource they didn't know existed, or one contact they, could, they can reach out to when someone needs help. To get things started today, I want to tell you about an incredible woman named Sophia Giraldo. Sophia is a survivor of domestic violence. Back in December of 2022, Sophia was able to get out of her abusive relationship, file for divorce, and become an advocate for other survivors through her very active podcast. Unfortunately, her abuser found out about the podcast and he was angry. So one day, right after Christmas, he was dropping the children off at um, Sophia's house after a visit, just like every other week. But this time, when Sophia came out of her apartment, he told his children to keep their seatbelts on. He then drove his car into Sophia, causing the car to flip over. He climbed out the window over his own son and stabbed Sophia in the chest. Sophia survived the assault and only thanks to the friendship and the prayers and everything of her family and friends did this happen. And her friend, Elizabeth De Jesus, is here to talk about her own journey as a DV survivor, as well as Sophia's, so that Sophia's voice can be heard. I'm going to share Sophia's story. Audra, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. Um, I'll just let you know when to slide to the next slide for me. Um, so my name is Elizabeth De Jesus, as Audra mentioned. I want to continue to speak Sophia's name. Um, and so I've agreed to come on here and let you guys know some of our story. We are both uh, domestic violence survivors. Um, and I like to call Sophia my sister. She, to me, is chosen family. And chosen family, if you guys aren't familiar with that term, is folks who become so close to you that you choose them as your family members. And so um, I was there when she got married. I was there when she had her children. Um, her children all call me auntie, and I all I call them all my nephews. Um, thankfully, because of that relationship we have, um, when the incident, when the attack happened to her, my name was on the emergency contact list on her fridge. And I was, um, I was called to come in and take care of my nephews. Um, so, but I want to backtrack a little bit and just begin by telling you a little bit about myself and then um, some of Sophia's history. If you can slide to the next slide, Audra. Um, so I am a DV survivor. Um, I got married uh, right after college um, in 2010, and my marriage fell apart. Um, I lost my marriage in 2018. And five years later, just two weeks ago from today, I finally re received my final judgment of divorce. Um, I'm a mommy of two wonderful boys, ages nine and eight. I'm a business owner, nonprofit director speaker and life coach. Um, Sophia Geraldo was my, is my friend, my sister. She also was my colleague in that she helped me um, form the business and nonprofit that I am now a part of. Um, she's a DV survivor, mommy of three boys, ages 7, 10, and 13. Um, she is a business owner as well, apart from the business that we started together. She is a family specialist, a speaker, and a trauma coach. And just so that you guys are able to see some of the work that she did, I believe that that link is clickable where it says her podcast and more. I want you guys to be able to see her page. This is something that she created 
um, in order to help other women through trauma, betrayal, trauma, and abuse. And so if you if you scroll to, I think, one, two, three, the third one there, that's her latest podcast, and you'll be able to listen to her story and some of the some of the great resources that she hands out on that podcast. Um, I think we could go back to the slide. Uh, next slide. So one of the things that um, Sophia and I embarked on, so let me tell you guys a little bit about our journey. I met Sophia in church. She came to church as a missionary from Maryland. Um, and she, when she, when she got to Mar when she got to New York, she didn't have much. She was living in a basement. The basement was unfurnished. Um, and both of us were single. We both started our relationship with our husbands around the same time. We got married around the same time. Um, and we did start having children around the same time. So I got to see her as a single person and then as a person dating and then as a married person and then as a mom. Um, and one of the things that um, struck us about, you know, she knew my spouse, I knew her spouse. We all went to the same church together. Um when we found out that we were in a destructive relationship, we found out around the same time we were talking. We we're like, this is, this is, this feels kind of weird. This feels kind of weird. Maybe let's go find resources for our marriage. At the time I was a life coach and I was coaching her through some things and then realizing there were some things popping up in my marriage as well. And we started, we began to look for resources together. What we found at the time was that we had a lot of, we, we didn't have a lot of support. We were very isolated in our situations. We didn't, we felt a lot of shame to talk about it. Um, and when we did talk about it, it our talks began in church. Um, and we realized that the church community that we were particularly a part of, which was a very, it was um, a very co college age group, you know? So how many college students do you know that are married? <laughs> let alone going through, you know, some 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 of the DV situations that we were going through. Um, so a lot of them were not able to answer questions for us. And we got a lot of, you know, um, pushback in terms of whether or not we should stay or go. And so we found a resource and it was a faith-based resource. We, her and I care a lot about our faith. And so we wanted to look for a resource that was faith-based. And we found somebody called Leslie Vernick, who was a coach. And she was coaching women who are going through abuse. And this is one of one of the lessons, the very first lessons that we learned. Um, her name is Leslie Vernick, if you want to look her up. Um, but she said, you have to make a decision whether to stay well or leave well. Now, I want to just put this on notice right now. Sometimes you don't have the option to stay well or leave well. And I'm going to give you an example of kind of what me and Sophia went through as we were navigating the realization that we were in a destructive, abusive marriage. So the questions that we had to ask ourselves, do I have to leave now? Do I even have the option to stay well? Do I have the option of making a plan to leave well? We there 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 was a time for Sophia and a time for me where we had to say I have to leave now and we had to ask ourselves do I have to leave now? Is it so dangerous that I don't have time to make a plan and that I don't have time to make an exit an, an a, a safety exit plan and I don't have time to navigate what I need to stay well? Um, so the questions we asked, do I have, do I have to leave now? Am I or my children in immediate danger? Are my finances compromised to the point where I can't get my basic needs met? And do I have time to make a plan? So, um, both of us at first tried to stay well, um, with her ex-husband, her now ex-husband at the time you know, she had started to find out about some of his addictions that fueled his abusive behaviors. And I had began finding out about addictions that fueled my husband's addictions behavior. And I had to say to myself, you know, am I in danger? At first for me, I was in immediate danger in that um, my husband had 
my former husband had put his hands on me and I had to separate myself from him right away. Um, for her, his, uh, his addictions did not display, his abuse did not display itself um, physically yet. And so she had made a plan to stay well. And so she had got connected with a therapist. She had got connected with a support group. She had got connected with a, a life coach um, that was specifically trained in the areas of abuse. And that was big for her. She wanted to find people who were specifically trained in areas of domestic violence and abuse. Um, until the day where, oh, you can stay on that slide beforehand. Um, until the day where, you know, um, her her ex-husband put his hands on her and was his addiction displayed itself in that um, he was forcing himself on her and wouldn't let go until she obliged to what he wanted. Um, on that day, I remember she called me. And she said, this is what's happening. I feel so embarrassed about it. And I feel ashamed. I can't believe this is happening to me. And it was just a wild realization. Um, you know, her growing up as a pastor's kid, me growing up as a, as a pastor's kid, never having experience or even thinking that we would be in this kind of marriage. Because ideally, right, we, we came into this marriage thinking we're going, we're, we're coming into a safe space that is gonna be supportive and, and, and ultimately, hopefully a satisfying marriage only to find out that we were not just unsatisfied, but we were unsafe. Um, and so she calls me and she said, this is what's happening. I'm super embarrassed about it. And I was uh, encouraging her to tell her, to tell her therapist, to tell her caseworker. She was also connected with, I believe somebody from Safe Horizon. Um, and at that point, we were also connected, both of us, with uh, the Family Justice Center, who had provided, um, who was providing therapy. Um, and so she got in touch with her caseworker. She got in touch with her therapist. And she was also in a support group um, that was led by the Family Justice Center as well. Um, and she told, she, you know, she told her the situation that happened. Um, in terms of, you know, him being physical. And it was very obvious at that point that she could no longer stay well because she was in danger. For me, when my husband put his hands on me, um, it was also obvious there's immediate danger. I cannot stay well. Thank God we had the kind of community um, where, you know, we had somewhere to go. When I had to leave my home, she took me in. Um, and I was there with her with my children. So it was five boys, two single moms, five boys. Um, and then when she could no longer stay at her place, I took her in and she lived with me for six months um, before she went into a shelter. Um, so I want to talk real quick about some of the myth, myth busters. When the, the day that she made that phone call to me and told me, I'm, I feel ashamed. I feel like this is crazy. I don't know what to do. I don't know who to talk to. Um, we had many follow-up conversations and some of the conversations um, uh, that we had had these myths that we were kind of replaying in our mind over and over and over again. And so I want to talk about what was the context of those myths and what was holding us back from making the call of getting help. Um, the first one was, I'm alone. And what tends to happen with a lot of people that I have come in contact with in my support group and what has definitely happened for me and Sophia as we were realizing that we were in a destructive relationship was that we looked around and we felt very alone. We Before we got into our support groups, we didn't know that there were other women going through the same thing. And on top of that, we're like, Man, like we 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 did all the things right beforehand, you know? Like we made sure we tried to vet our our husbands, we went to school, we did, you know, the good girl thing, you know, whatever that stereotype is. So we thought we had all our boxes checked, but domestic violence does not discriminate against any doesn't matter what job you have, it doesn't matter 
you know, what you did beforehand, you know, the your partner is going to do what they want to do. And we had to kind of just come to that realization that it it really was about the part more about our partners and not about us. Um, and so before we came to that realization, we felt very alone. We felt like ashamed. We felt like we did something wrong, you know, and we didn't feel like we saw a whole lot of people talking about any kind of abuse in their own marriages. And so we, we, we felt very isolated. Um, the other thing is if I leave, I'll be dishonoring my faith and my family. Again, domestic violence and abuse does not discriminate against faith or family structure. We were able to find resources that were faith-based. So we come from a Christian worldview and we were able to find a Christian life coach who was well-versed in the dynamics of abuse and domestic violence. We just had to go further than, you know, our immediate church circle to find it, you know. Um, but the resources are out there. Um, the other one was, I'll emotionally scar my children for life. This one was a really big one because, you know, um, we were, Sophia and I were both brought up with the idea of husband and wife coming together, making a family and staying within that family unit. Um, and that anything beyond that would hurt our children. What we came to realize as we participated in our programs, in our support programs, were that there, there are so many survivors who have said to us, it is more dangerous to stay in a, in an abusive relationship where you are not getting your needs met, where you are not um uh building your resources um that can be more emotionally scarring for the children than it would be to leave well or to stay well okay so if we go back to the slide where it says leave well or stay well did we did we get that slide yet yeah right can we go back to that slide oh we didn't get there yet right So, sorry, Elizabeth, I can't, I can't go back on here. Okay, that's okay. So I'll just, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just talk it out. So leaving well means that you create a safe exit plan in order to leave the relationship, leave the marriage, whether it be long-term or temporary. Staying well can also be long-term or temporary, but staying well means that you um, create a situation for yourself where you are safe and you are also building your own resources and satisfaction for a healthy living. So that is staying well. So as long as your partner is not creating any immediate danger, is not impeding on your mental health, is not impeding on, on your physical health, financial health, you know, you might be in a, in a, situation where you know he's got some addictions but you know maybe he's working on it or maybe he's got addictions but you're not really engaging with that part of the of his life or the marriage or whatever um and you're able to stay well in that you are able to build a satisfying life for yourself and build your resources either season either for that season temporarily or long term so what we've come to realize Sophia and I in our conversations as we were a part of our support group was that there were women who were staying but not staying well. And if you're not able to stay well, that can be much more emotionally scarring for our children than it would have been to leave well and continue to build a satisfying life that had resources. So that's what I'm trying to say with that. I feel like I was, it took me a while to say that, but that's what I was trying to say. Let's go back just for one second. There was there was like two more mythbusters there, but that's okay. You know, it was <laughs> I know we can't go back. Um off the top of my head, you know, the the other ones were I'm if I leave, I'm going to be uh setting myself up for a life of poverty or struggle. Now, what we found as we decided to stay well and then later on to leave well and create a safety exit plan was that 
there are so many resources and so much community surrounding domestic violence and abuse survivors that we really are in a position where of empowerment now, you know, um, getting connected and being open and vocal about what the struggle is instead of being isolated and secluded and feeling like I'm the only one going through this or, you know, I feel like I'm crazy. I don't understand my situation. Well, if you don't understand your situation, there are people who are going through the same thing or who have gone through the same thing, who are willing and able to come alongside you to help empower you. I remember in the Family Justice Center, um, when I first got there, there were finan financial advisors and I was financially broken at the time. I've been able over time to build my finances to a certain extent and I'm still building. Um, and thank God I'm at, I'm, I'm at a point where I can say whether I am at the top or you know, try, still trying to build, you know, I have people to help me. And I think that for me has been the most empowering thing, whether it's in regards to finances, career, um, mental health help, um, I'm still seeing a therapist from the from the Family Justice Center, and now I'm I'm also a part of a 12 step program um, that helps me talk about the dynamics of abuse and domestic violence. Um, and so, uh, that was another myth, you know, and 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 it kind of tagged along with being um, feeling alone and being isolated. Once you're able to kind of bust that myth you also start to see that there's actually many, many resources to help empower and get you back on your feet. So when did we finally make the call? My marriage fell apart completely the day that um, my husband at the time uh, put his hands on my children and I saw bruises on my children. And that was when I went to my caseworker at the Family Justice Center and I said, this is what's happening. I don't think I can stay well. And there were many times where I was staying well and then leaving well and then staying well and then leaving well. The final time was when I saw bruises on my children. I went to my caseworker. I told him, we called ACS together. And I remember so clearly needing that time to needing that extra support of having him there for me to even make that phone call because I was shaking, I was in tears, my voice was cracking, and he was being he he was on the other side of the desk going, "You can do this, you got this, you got this." As I was talking to the ACS worker, um, for her, she called me, she called her caseworker and her therapist who encouraged her to leave, um, and then she also called our pastor, um, from church who came to her house had the conversation with her husband, hey, Sophia's leaving now and she's going to grab her stuff. And he, he, that was part of her safety plan in leaving well was to have another person there while she broke the news to her ex-husband and made her exit. And so he was able to be there, facilitate that um, interaction, and then she was able to exit. Um, so that was part of her leaving well. So here are our truths. We have some of these three these three truths that we we stood on and I we still stand on to this day um, that help break those myths for us. The first one I love quoting Sophia because Sophia just has some really great like nuggets of wisdom. Um, the first thing that she taught me was right in the middle: living for an audience of one, meaning there's going to be a lot of people that are not going to understand because they haven't been through it. Whether those are friends or family or people from church they are they, they could be well-intentioned people but they might not understand because they haven't been through it two there might be people who are on different spectrums when it comes to faith you know and and they might have different beliefs and that's okay if they have different beliefs you can still find people who are in your you know uh faith or religious background who have gone through this and can navigate it with you. Um, like I said before, there are resources everywhere for every background. So living for an audience of one, for us, that meant our higher power, God. And so what does God have to say about my situation? Does he want this for my marriage? You know, and one of the things we talked through was God loves marriage, but he does not love marriage more than he loves the people in the marriage, the individual people in the marriage. And so we made it a point to live for an audience of one and say, what does God want? And I'm going to follow that. Now for, you know, people who might not be 
faith-based or have a different higher power, you know, an audience of one could mean a lot of different things. It could mean, you know, the one could be your family. One could be your higher power. One could be yourself, you know? Um, but that's what it was for us. Another thing that Sophia used to say all the time, recovery is not a race. You don't have to feel bad if it's taking you longer than you thought it would. Elizabeth, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm going to have to move you along in a minute just so that we can get to our other panelists. This is amazing. And your story and Sophia's is incredible, but I, I do need to move you along a little bit. Okay, no problem. I'm finishing up right now. I'm wrap it up. Um, the last one, the last nugget of truth is that when you are a part of community, you multiply your joys and you're able to divide your burdens. And I can say that 100% even till today, because when Sophia's attack happened, all of the people helpers rushed in and help to divide those burdens. And I call those people faces of hope. Audra's one of them. You know, Susan is one of them. Um, people who really came alongside us and help us, helped us get through that. And now we're seeing awesome progress for Sophia's health. Um, are we going to get to do the video or? I'm actually going to put it in the chat, Elizabeth, so that okay. people can go to Sophia's Instagram and her podcast and see her awesome. because she is a force to be reckoned with and was and is an incredible woman, and so are you. And I just wanted to thank you for telling your story and sharing it. I know how difficult that is. So yes, thank, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you guys for listening. When you get a chance, please, you know, meet Sophia. Meet Sophia. That link is for you guys to actually meet Sophia and see what she's all about. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. I now have the honor of introducing our Bureau Chief of the Domestic Violence Bureau here at the Queens County District Attorney's Office, Mary Kate Quinn. Chief Quinn is a graduate, a student of um, St. John's Law School, where she's an adjunct professor, and she's dedicated her career to the Queens County District Attorney's Office as a DV prosecutor. She's a passionate advocate and a champion for survivors and of DV, and now I turn it over to you, Chief Quinn. Thank you so much, Audra, for the introduction and also for all your hard work in putting this webinar together. I am so proud to serve as the Domestic Violence Bureau Chief under District Attorney Melinda Katz. And whenever I have the opportunity to speak on DA Katz's behalf, I start by delivering the message that DA Katz herself delivered to survivors of domestic violence when she promised to work collaboratively to keep survivors safe. The message she delivered to survivors in the early days of the pandemic when she created a 24-hour domestic violence helpline guaranteeing them access to an assistant district attorney 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so that no one would ever have to feel alone or unsafe in their home. And the message that we, the ADAs of the Domestic Violence Bureau, deliver to survivors every single day here at the Family Justice Center. You are not alone. We are here to help. So now I think it's important to know who is fighting for survivors of domestic violence in Queens County, because it's a true team effort at the Queens Family Justice Center. The Family Justice Center is home to the Domestic Violence Bureau of the Queens DA's office and run by the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence. And it's a true one-stop shop for victims of domestic violence. But I'm going to just spend a few minutes talking to you about the ADAs in the Domestic Violence Bureau. Because just last year, DA Katz created the Special Prosecutions Division to ensure that domestic violence cases were handled by highly trained and specialized ADAs who handle not only domestic violence cases, but cases involving defendants who prey on the most vulnerable members of our community. I'm thrilled that our Bureau is part of this division under Executive Assistant District Attorney Joyce Smith. I'm also thrilled to report that DA Katz has increased the size of the Domestic Violence Bureau to include 28 attorneys, including five managers, all of whom have dedicated their careers to our mission of eradicating domestic violence. And as the Domestic Violence Bureau Chief, I can promise you that if you or someone you love reports that they have been abused by an intimate partner, the case will be handled by an ADA trained to truly understand the dynamics of power and control, the cycle of abuse, someone who understands the trauma associated with domestic violence, 
the pressures you may face from your family, friends, or community. Someone who will take the time to get to the root of the problem and provide support to keep you safe. Our office recognizes that we cannot fight the battle against domestic violence alone. DA Katz wants all survivors to truly believe her message that they are not alone. We are here to help. Our partners are here to help. And the community is here to help. DA Katz recognizes the importance of community outreach and education when it comes to fighting domestic violence, which is why we are so thrilled to host this webinar and to introduce you to some of our partners fighting on behalf of domestic violence survivors. Thank you again, Audra. Thank you so much, Chief Quinn. I wanna welcome our next speaker, Detective Voss from the NYPD. Detective Voss has been with the NYPD for almost 30 years and currently serves as the Chief of Department for the Domestic Violence Training Unit, where he's responsible for training all of our domestic violence officers. Now to tell you more about his role and the role of our domestic violence units in the NYPD, I welcome Detective Voss. Yes, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Yusuf Vass. Um, as was stated, I'm actually one of the trainers in the Chief Department Domestic Violence Unit, who's actually the chief of that particular unit is Chief Eager. Um, she sees our plan. She sees the direction that she wants the job to go into in regards to caring for survivors of domestic violence. Now, throughout New York City, we have 77 precincts. Within those 77 precincts, every precinct has a domestic violence staff. That may include an officer, detective, supervisors, and so on and so forth. In addition to that, we have other units who work alongside us to make sure victims are, feel safe and are safe. Uh, what is the purpose of the domestic violence officers? They're there to work one-on-one, -on -one, hand in hand with survivors of domestic violence. I know a lot of times we see officers respond to different um, situations outside the street, but the DVOs or domestic violence officers, their task is actually to work one-on-one -on -one with survivors, see their needs, their wants, and give them some of the advice that they wouldn't normally see someone giving them because they're not familiar with a particular officer walking down the street. Now, and a lot of times, some people feel as if the DVOs are more sensitive, um, to their needs. And that's a lot of um, questions and statements that we get from survivors. And we welcome that because we specially handpick them and we train them to understand the needs of our survivors. And some of those needs may include making a home visit, checking to see if that, that particular survivor is okay, see if they need any additional services that the department can help, or even our partners like Safe Horizon and CVAC can actually help us along with other outside agencies just to bring that victim or that survivor to feel as if they have a grasp of their life once and during a uh, domestic incident has taken place. A lot of times people are familiar with, we have um, the chief department personnel stationed inside of the family justice centers. Now, what's the purpose of them being there? They're there actually to do the same thing that an officer in a domestic violence unit will do. The, a victim can go to the safe, a safe place, make a report. The officers there will do every paperwork that's needed as far as if they have to take pictures, they have to uh, vouch your evidence. And they're actually there to take the victim's statement. And the purpose of them doing that, because we know some survivors are not willing to come to the precincts for a host of reasons. And some of them could be just the stigma of walking into a building with a lot of officers and they feel as if their secret is let out and everyone is aware of what they're going through. So the officers in the chief department's office who are stationed in the safe in these safe places actually allow them to come in to have their dignity well restored and they feel comfortable talking to the officers, all right? The officers are in plain clothes. There's nothing there to allude that they're actually having a conversation with the officers and they're set aside in a private room. So this particular unit is set aside for victims of domestic violence, victims of elder abuse, and victims of sex, sex trafficking. Now you can um, find all these officers located in all the five boroughs. I believe that there is a slide with the exact locations um, if you need to talk to any one of them, you can feel free to send them an email or you can actually call them direct. And once again, the officers are there to assist victims and also work in a partnership with the DA's office and our other partner agencies that may need additional assistance from NYPD. Thank you again.
Thank you so much, Detective Voss. That was really helpful. And you led me into my next introduction, which is our Family Justice Center um, Executive Director, Susan Jacobs. We're so happy to have you join us today. Um, Susan has been with the Family Justice Center for over 15 years. She's a fierce advocate for our survivors. And thank you so much for sharing some information about our Family Justice Center, as well as some practical advice on how we can help our neighbors when they are in trouble. Thank you, Audra. Thank you so much to Queens DA Katz, Mary Kate and Audra for hosting this very important uh, topic. It is an honor to be with all of you in this space to uplift a very important topic. Thank you to everyone here who is in this virtual space because you care so deeply for survivors. And whether we know it or not, we all know someone who is suffering in silence because of domestic violence. Elizabeth, a huge shout out to you. You are a true inspiration and a hero. Thank you so much to Dia Katz again for the incredible generosity and support you have shown to survivors of domestic violence as we cannot do this work without you. We're so grateful as well for the lovely donations to the QFJC you provided, which is going to help so many of our clients and their children. We at the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence are truly honored to be here with you. So just talking about the Family Justice Center, there is a Family Justice Center in every single borough and survivors of domestic and gender-based violence can be connected to free and confidential assistance. We have incredible partners, including contracted partner agencies such as Sanctuary for Families Legal, and you'll be hearing from amazing Lindsay shortly, Greenwich House and Arab American Family Support Center, and 20 organizations, which include many agencies embedded in the community, and we certainly could not do the work without them. So you can call any, fam any Family Justice Center at 311, but the Queens Family Justice Center we are available from Monday through Wednesday, Friday, 718-575-4545. And you can get connected to any of the other centers by calling 311. So the New York City Family Justice Center, um, survivors can get connected to free and confidential assistance, which includes sexual violence, human trafficking, stalking, and intimate partner violence. Um, and please do leave a message as well. We promise we will get back to you. Um, and through the, any of the Family Justice Center, survivors of domestic and gender-based violence and their children can get connected to organizations that provide case management, economic empowerment, counseling, civil legal, criminal legal assistance, and um, some of the things in, in general, we can talk about planning for safety, applying for public benefits, shelter, housing, and other support services, mental health and counseling services, which is provided by Greenwich House. They also provide our fabulous children's program where clients, uh, clients, children, and staff do not want to leave. Um, and we also offer uh, training bro programs, including help with resumes and interview skills, uh, legal consultation for orders of protection, custody, visitation, child support, divorce, housing, and immigration, being connected to trained law enforcement. And I know we just heard from NYPD. We have an amazing officer here, Officer Greenway, who, who just is incredible. And she's incredible with domestic violence survivors. And of course, as I mentioned, we're very proud of this, our child care for children when they are getting services at the FJC. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about safety planning. Um, some of the safety planning tips that we ask for in terms of risk factors associated with potential homicide are stalking, um, and it's recognizing early signs of this, of course. Um, so we talk about nine risk factors in particular, which includes stalking, strangulation, sexual assault, coerced sex, escalation of physical abuse, access to guns, threats to kill, recent separation, and within the first year, children who are not the abusers, violence during pregnancy. So those are a couple of different things that we focus on. And I just want to say that every survivor of domestic violence has their own sense of what will keep them safe. For some people, being safe, safer means leaving their abusive partners. And for others, it means staying with the person causing harm and finding ways to be safer at home with that person. There is not one way to plan for safety that works for everyone. At the Family Justice Center, we will help you create your individualized 
plan. So a couple of different steps for safety planning is plan one, making a safety plan, right? That's the first key, which is many victims of domestic find, find it helpful um, to create that safety plan. So the recommendations are, of course, call 911 if the person becomes uh, violent. Ask neighbors and friends and family to intervene or call 911 if they hear arguing or loud voices. Use noisemakers such as whistles or personal alarms. And we have something called Home Plus. Um, and basically Home Plus is an alarm system which can connect many survivors for a variety of different reasons opt not to go into the shelter system. So the so the uh, the panic buttons, for lack of a better word, is a helpful way to keep survivors safer in their homes. Um, and anyone, we can talk to you about Home Plus um, as well. Um, choose a code word you can use with friends. Obtain an order of protection, save copies, save copies important uh, documents in a secure uh, location. If abuser does become violent, avoid entering rooms with multiple exits and always being on the lookout for all of those things. Practice your escape plan with your children. One of the other things, we're not gonna get into it right now, but once you come in, we have a fabulous children's program and we can also help plan with your children around that, around you know, uh, incorporating them in the safety planning. Be prepared to leave if you did wanna do that, right? Prepare an escape bag, um, consider, consist, consider trusting your close friends or relatives, change of clothing for your children, medication, right? Money, checkbooks, ATM, diapers, formulas, an address book with phone numbers of contact. Um, and medication is one of the key things. Many, um, that's one of the most important things that we ask survivors to keep in their go bag if they did choose to do that. And, Last but not least, staying safe, right? Um, useful safety tips is rental documents, phone bills, obtain an unlisted phone number, use a post uh, post box office, right? Keep up copies of your orders of protection uh, on your cell phones and your homes and install metal detectors, all of these things which is really, really key. And the Family Justice Center, we know that this is a lot. Um, and the Family Justice Center, we have multiple different agencies here at the Queens Family Justice Center, and it's a one-stop shop, which is which is great resource, right? So when you walk in, you don't have to do this alone. You are not alone. So we have various different services, lawyers, NYPD, we have the children's program. So all these providers can provide you that support because we know it is a lot. Um, and also, I just want to say um, also as well, what not to say to survivors, especially we all, you know, I talked about this early, we all know a survivor, whether you know it or not, right? And this month is a good, good remembrance to say that, you know, we are here to support the communities and how it is important. But I just want to say in terms of what not to say and what to say, avoid victim blaming statements such as, why didn't you leave, right? Why did you call the police? being non-judgmental, ask open-ended questions, give survivors control of how much of their experience they want to share. And it's really important. Survivors, it takes about seven times for someone to leave the abusive situations, but there are many, many reasons, as Elizabeth mentioned, why someone can't leave the relationship. And we, we should be there to support them because you know, I think for many times we've seen survivors who have come here, use our, utilize our services for many, many many times here right because it is extremely difficult it is there's it's there's so much complexity so it's really understand to for us to realize that they are doing each and everything possible to keep themselves and their children safe on a daily basis and i've seen that um so there is a family justice center in every single borough please call 311 i want to also let survivors know of domestic and gender by based violence that we are here for you and you are not alone. Thank you again so much to the DA's office for inviting me. I really appreciate all of you. Thank you so much, Susan, for that incredible and practical advice. As Susan mentioned, there's so many partner agencies here at the Queens Family Justice Center. And one such partner agency is Sanctuary for Families. Today, we have the Associate Program Director of the Family Law Project, Lindsay Song. Lindsay and I would like to address an issue that comes up quite often in our practice, which is orders of protection. Orders of protection 
can be obtained through the criminal justice system after an arrest is made, but they can also be obtained through the family court. Lindsay, will you share some insight into who can obtain a family court order protection and how? Thank you, Lindsay, for joining us. Sure, of course. I'm very proud and grateful to be here with so many incredible panelists and organizations um, all out of the Family Justice Center and the Queen's DA's office. Um, my practice is primarily in family court, um, but I do work with criminal advocacy. I often help folks who file in family court for orders of protection. So if you are someone um, who you are filing a, or are interested in getting protection against someone um, with the categories of relationships that I'm going to describe, then you can get an order of protection in family court in the borough where you live. So we are obviously in Queens, uh, but there are family courts in all five boroughs. And for a family court, you can file for an order of protection against somebody um, again, with whom you are related to by blood or marriage. So if you are currently or formerly married to them, um, if you have an in-law relationship with them, so this means, you know, um, your partner's, you know, parents or siblings or um, brothers or sisters or cousins, if there is a relationship through marriage um, or if you're related by blood. And blood, I should clarify, qualifies, you know, a sanguinity is the, how it's described in the statute. Um, that is adoption or, um, you know, traditional genetic relationships, right? It's still um, a relationship that you have with that person by blood. Um, if you have a child in common with someone, um, whether or not you have lived together ever or whether or not you have, um, or you, you are married if you have a child with them. And finally, the biggest category that we see is people who have or had an intimate relationship with another person. So this doesn't have to be romantic or sexual um, or dating relationship, but it does often, you know, just often defined in that way. Um, you don't have to have, um, you know, had a sexual relationship with this person. Um, however, the courts will look at the nature, duration of the relationship and determining whether or not you have or had an intimate relationship with this person. So, for example, one that often does not qualify is like a roommate relationship or a landlord, okay? You cannot file a family court order protection against your landlord because you do not have an intimate relationship with that person. Um, if you have a question on whether or not the relationship that you have with this person qualifies qualifies for a family court order of protection, come into the FJC, happy to do a screening and kind of talk through. Um, and also we have some great partners who can also advise of that. But if you have you know, been with somebody, you have dated them, you have been had a significant relationship with them, um, then you can file for an order of protection in family court most likely. And do you, do you want me to go into the types of relief, Audra? Or do you want me to overview criminal court orders of protection or did you want to do that? Can you actually go into the types of relief? Yeah, sure. Family? So what you can get for an order of protection in family court um, is you can ask for the following relief, but also it's a little bit open-ended. Um, so you can ask for alternate forms of relief as long as they go to further the purposes of protection. That's what the law says. So um, you can ask for somebody you know, to be removed from a shared home. And exclusion is only when you live together with this person. So it's you do not exclude someone from your home if you do not currently live with them. Exclusion is a drastic remedy. It's a big ask from the court to kick somebody out out of the house, whether you are living with them. Um, and so it's typically something that is done with kind of a high standard. There is not a legal requirement that there have been current or former recent physical violence. However, judges often look to that and determining whether or not to grant an exclusion. Um, something such as a very, very severe and specific threat might rise to that level, but typically um, they will, judges often look to whether or not there's been recent physical violence. If you um, are not living with this person, you could ask for a stay away order, which means the person is ordered to stay away from you, from your home, your work, whatever specific elements of the stay away that you would like. Um, children, except for court ordered custody or visitation, um, there could be an exception and almost always there is an exception for court orders of custody or visitation. It will say stay away from the children except for um, orders of custody and visitation. And that would also likely include no communication um, by by pretty much any means, including third party, um, which means that a person cannot pass along a message to you from that person. It does not mean that there's a stay away order and that person can't talk to your mom or your grandma or your neighbor. That's not what third party means, um, but it does mean that they cannot contact you through a third person. Um, and then there's this element that's usual terms. What does this mean? Refrain from committing family offenses or acts created. Basically, it means do not commit a crime against against you. And folks might be wondering, how is that helpful, right? There's an order that's telling me that, or that telling this person that they cannot commit a crime against me. Crimes are already illegal. 
Why would that be helpful? It's because the penalty for violating an order of protection is a mandatory arrest under the law. And so if someone did commit a family offense and you're living together with them, for instance, if you do not get an exclusion, you could get a limited order of protection so you can live together with that person, but have what's called a usual terms or limited order of protection and then call the police. And if that person had damaged your property, thrown things around, broken things, threatened you, God forbid, you know, physically assaulted you or harmed you in some way. And you call the police and you indicate this and the police believe that there is a credible, you know, that they go through their analysis. If there's a violation of the order of protection, then there is a mandatory arrest. So it can still be a very powerful tool um, versus if you were just calling the police and there is no order of protection, right? Um, because then it's criminal contempt. There are other provisions that can be added depending on the circumstances. If someone has threatened to post or actually Actually posted intimate images of you, meaning naked, topless, bottomless images or images or video where you are engaging in sexual acts. That is illegal in New York as of 2019 for anyone that did not know. And you can go to family court or criminal court for remedies, um, but that can also be added in a family court order of protection. Um, you can also go back into your home to get belongings if you have left the home and you would like to get your things, or if the other person is removed from the home, they can get an order to come back in, typically with a police escort. It's also possible to ask for a temporary order of custody or child support. However, as a family court practitioner, I find this very rare that judges will grant this. Typically, they will just tell you to go separately file for custody or child support support. But again, you could ask for if somebody's harassing you and following you. I had one at a dance studio. You could ask for stay away from your dance studio, stay away from my child's soccer practice. These are able to be fashioned in family court in order to further the purposes of protection. Lindsay, thank you so much. Just for the sake of time, um, I'm going to move past your next slide, but please visit Lindsay at the Family Justice Center. She is a wealth of knowledge on so many topics regarding family court, and um, we really thank her for her expertise. Our next panelist, um, Detective Boston, mentioned that there are Safe Horizon advocates at the precincts, and I'm honored to introduce you to one of Safe Horizon's best, uh, Dale Carter. Dale is the director of the Queen's Criminal Court Program for Safe Horizon. Dale comes to us with over 20 years of social service experience and over 15 years with Safe Horizon. She's gonna share some advice on what we can do in situations when a survivor may not wanna get the criminal justice system involved, but wants to do what they can to stay safe or know their options. Dale, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Audra. Thank you, DA Katz, and thank you to the Domestic Violence Bureau for having me here today. So Safe Horizon has programs located throughout the five boroughs in the family courts, criminal courts, police precincts, shelters, child advocacy centers, community offices, and the Manhattan Family Justice Center. Today, I'll be speaking about our program in the precincts, the Crime Victims Assistance Program, which we refer to as CVAP. The Crime Victims Assistance Program, CVAP, is a cornerstone of New York City's effort to improve its response to victims of crime. Implemented by NYPD, the Mayor's Office, and Safe Horizon, CVAP is available in all precincts and housing police service areas citywide. The program has dedicated victim advocates for, for survivors of domestic violence and additional advocates for victims of every other category of crime. CVAP provides supportive counseling, connections to individual or group therapy, and help navigating the legal and financial challenges that emerge after a crime has occurred. Advocates are available Monday through, through Friday between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. When a crime is reported to NYPD, CVAP advocates will contact the victims by phone after a police report is filed, assist victims who walk into a precinct seeking help, help victims identify and address their most pressing safety concerns, help victims develop a safety plan that meets their individual needs, inform victims of their rights and options, and link them to available services, explore eligibility for victim, co victim compensation and help victims apply as needed. They advocate on behalf of victims with various systems such as criminal justice, housing, and public benefits and conduct home visits with police officers. If a victim doesn't feel comfortable walking into a precinct, because sometimes it could be a little bit intimidating, they can call the Safe Horizon 24-hour toll-free hotline at 1-800-621-4673 that's 1-800-621-HOPE. They'll get connected to a case manager. That case manager will provide a safety assessment, a safety plan, and connect those that victim for services. Victims can also utilize the Safe Horizon one-on-one -on -one online chat system, Safe Chat, 
if they log on to the Safe Horizons um, website, there's a link. They just click that link. They'll get connected to a case manager, and that case manager will email them um, for help with services. Thank you all for having me here today. Thank you so much, Dale. I really appreciate everything you do for our survivors every day and all of that great advice. Last but certainly not least, I want to introduce you to my colleague and my friend here at the Queens District Attorney's Office, the Bureau Chief of our Rehabilitation Programs and Restorative Services Bureau, Aisha Green. Aisha is a graduate of Columbia Law School, and if I sat here and told you her entire resume today, it would take me the next hour. She is one of the most impressive people I have met. I'm going to welcome Aisha to share some information about two of her units here in the DA's office, the Crime Victim Advocates Program and the Diversion Alternative Sentencing Unit. Thank you so much, Aisha, for joining us. Audra, thank you so much for uh, your warm welcome. And also to the distinguished panelists here, uh, I have the privilege of working with all of the organizations that are represented here. Uh, so I do want to talk to you a little bit about the Queens County uh, Crime Victim Advocate Program. I know Dale just talked about uh, Safe Horizons, but we also have one here within the office. Uh, District Attorney Melinda Katz wants to make sure that the Crime Victims Advocates Program is here to help victims of crime navigate the criminal justice system. Its mission is to aid the victims of crime in Queens County by providing concrete emotional and criminal justice support to all victims. Uh, the Crime Victims Advocate Program uh, is led by Ada Martinez, who is our director, uh, and she's a licensed mental health counselor uh, with her background specifically in trauma. Uh, so the Queens County District Attorney's Office's CVAP program is staffed with licensed mental health counselors, social workers, advocates, and application specialists. Uh, we are here to provide personal advocacy uh, within the office when crime victims victims and survivors are meeting with uh, assistant district attorneys and police officers. We also supply uh, emotional support, uh, criminal civil justice advocacy, application assistance. Uh, we want to make sure we're also speaking with people in the language that they're most comfortable. So we do have language services and we do have transportation services to and from our office to make it uh, easier for folks to come and meet with us. Additionally, uh, as I mentioned, if uh, there are survivors that are meeting with police officers, we will uh, have advocates uh, and our social workers or mental health counselors join those meetings uh, for support. Uh, additionally, when there are forensic interviews, and that could be within our office um, or also that could be within court. Um, again, we're helping people to apply for different public benefits. Uh, we make uh, referrals to uh, non-legal agencies and also help with uh, Office of Victim Services applications as well as NYCHA applications where uh, there is an immediacy for folks to move. And so uh, this is where you'll see we provide a lot of these supports because we want to make sure that victims uh, and survivors feel supported as they're going through the legal system, which can be very confusing. Uh, it can also be very overwhelming. Uh, so we want to make sure that our staff, uh, that we are uh, expertly trained in how to put together different types of applications. And while we uh, are not responsible or we uh, work with uh, OVS uh, and we don't do the approvals or determine how much uh, compensation someone might be eligible for, we want to make sure that all of the components of the application are uh, submitted. And so as you can see here, uh, we work with the Office of Victim Services. Uh, there are times where people are eligible for different reimbursement assistance, uh, and that could be for medical bills, for counseling bills, uh, funeral costs and other expenses uh, that are related to uh, the crime that has been committed. Uh, again, uh, you can come in and speak with us. You can speak to us over the phone. Uh, we also help people with NYCHA and Section 8 housing and also other benefits that people may be uh, eligible for when we're thinking about um, financial assistance for food or uh, energy bills or things like that. And so uh, there is a hot, uh, we have a hotline uh, so that you can get directly to uh, us. Um, it's staffed Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. You can also leave a message and feel free to leave a message in the language uh, most comfortable to you. We will get it translated. 
Uh, the number that uh, I believe it's going to also be put in the chat, but our number is 718-286-6812. Uh, and if there is anything else that you should need from us, please make sure to reach out to us. We are definitely here for you. Uh, and we will make sure that if we are unable to provide the service on site, such as counseling services or things like that, we will make sure to connect you to someone in the community to make sure that your needs are met. Thank you, Aisha. Can you share a little bit about your other hat that you wear? That's right. Uh, so there's more. Uh, so also too within my bureau, uh, and thank you very much, uh, is the Rehabilitation Program and Restorative Services or Alternative to Incarceration Unit. Uh, earlier in the program, uh, it was mentioned uh, that some people may have a resource need uh, that is also contributing to the violence that is happening in the home. And that could be because of a mental health or behavioral health issue, a serious mental illness. Uh, it could also be because of substance misuse when we're talking about alcohol, uh, a co-occurring disorder. Uh, and so what we do within the Rehabilitation Program and Restorative Services uh, Bureau is we make sure to screen for those needs. Uh, additionally, uh, that arm of the office, we are staffed with social workers, uh, CASACs, which are credentialed alcoholism and substance uh, abuse counselors. Uh, we have case managers and we have lawyers that are specially trained uh, to understand uh, when people need resource needs. We currently staff uh, 10 specialized court parts. Uh, and so those specialized court parts are for folks uh, in either mental health or uh, with a substance use issue. We have veterans courts. And so we uh, have these specialized courts so that we are able to place people in uh, programming that is appropriate to the need that they have. And so that information we are getting uh, in part from our survivors on what's happening within the home. Uh, so our assistant district attorneys speak with survivors to obtain this information about possible mental health or substance use issues. Uh, and also too, if there's any other type of resource need, we wanna make sure that we have people clinically assessed uh, for the resources that we believe will help them to stay out of the criminal legal system, but also to better uh, the relationship if people are going to uh, stay in relationship with one another. Uh, we realize that sometimes when people separate from one another, there may be children involved and things like that that keep the relationship going. So we want to make sure that those needs are addressed uh, so that people uh, can work together uh, with respect to children or other reasons for them to stay together. Mm -hmm. You can definitely, those, um, when a resource need is communicated to us from the survivor, uh, the ADA will reach out to us to let us know that there is a resource need that is there. And the offer of a program will come from the district attorney's office in, in appropriate cases. And it's something that is going to be mandated by the court. And so that takes the onus off of the uh, survivor to feel like they're responsible for putting that person in the program. Uh, they brought them themselves into the criminal legal system. And so it is the court and the people's offer along with counsel. We do work with defense attorneys um, to present that option to that person. Uh, and if they uh, avail themselves of that option, it is court ordered uh, and the court will check in to make sure that they are abiding by uh, the promises that they have made to participate in these programs. Um, and so that's how cases come to us. Again, uh, we will make sure to treatment plan uh, around the person that we have before us. Uh, and your input is definitely um, needed for us to discern where to go or where to look for that clinical evaluation. We get the clinical evaluation back and then we proceed from there. So um, Thank I you. think that's all for my presentation. And thank you, Audra, for reminding me about all of the hats uh, <laughs> that I have here within the district attorney's office. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate it, Aisha, because I think that's information that doesn't always get communicated, that when survivors come in, if uh, somebody doesn't want their abuser to necessarily go to jail, but they say that there's mental health or substance abuse issues that the office is going to take that into consideration and work with Aisha's team. Um, I want to share some important numbers with you that have been mentioned today. So we have the Queens District Attorney's Office CV hotline number, um, which is manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our direct phone number to the Bureau is shared here as long as we, along with our email address, as well as the CVAP number that Aisha just mentioned, 718-286-6812, the Safe Horizon hotline number, and the Queens Family Justice Center number. The Queens Family Justice Center number you can reach Lindsay at if you have any questions for her. Um, please feel free to reach out to her. 
I can't thank our panelists enough for their participation today, especially Elizabeth for keeping Sophia's voice going while she continues to recover. We hope to have her here for our fourth annual webinar next year. And thank you to our District Attorney Melinda Katz for continuing to be a champion of survivors of domestic violence and prioritizing the safety of our neighbors. If you take nothing else away from today, remember that you're not alone. We're here to help and always help your neighbors. That 911 call could save a life. And thank you for joining us. Stay safe.